Today we're going to talk about one of the most important mechanisms of the U.S. Constitution that decentralizes power called federalism. Federalism is the distribution of power between what and what? Between the U.S. government and the state governments. Federalism is the distribution of power between the U.S. government and the state governments. It is a relationship between the U.S. government and the state governments in the United States. We are no longer a confederation like in the articles where the states are the ones with most of the power and we had a weak central government. That's not the case. Power is shared between these two levels of government. What's important to note is the word itself, the word federalism, doesn't exist in the Constitution. You can't find it there. Um, however, it is heavily implied that there is a division of authority and power between the U.S. government and the state government. So we'll talk about that division of power today. The powers of the U.S. government, the powers of the national government or the federal government, is clearly defined in the U.S. Constitution. They're called express powers or enumerated powers. If you look at Article 1, Article 2, and Article 3, which pertains to your what? Constitution. Your three branches of the U.S. government. They clearly define the powers of the United States government, especially in Article 1. What's Article 1 about? The legislative branch. It clearly defines what are the powers of the U.S. government in the U.S. Constitution. They're called express powers. When it comes to state powers, it's a little bit more complicated. State powers are not clearly defined in the U.S. Constitution. There isn't a section in the U.S. Constitution that says these are what the states can do. However, what the states have is the Tenth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. The Tenth Amendment is very simple. If your eighth grade teacher did not teach you, very simple. Whatever power the U.S. Constitution does not give the federal government automatically belongs to who? States. It belongs to the states. So the U.S. Constitution may not explicitly say what states can do, what, or what policy areas do states have authority over, but the Tenth Amendment says whatever power that's not given to the U.S. government is automatically reserved. That's why we call them reserve powers. Reserve powers belong to state governments. Like, for example, education. The U.S. government does, does not mention education in the U.S. Constitution, so it is reserved to who? It is reserved to the states. Marriage, it's not mentioned in the U.S. Constitution. It's not given to the federal government, so it is reserved to the states. So whatever power the U.S. Constitution doesn't give to the federal government, it's reserved to the states. The Tenth Amendment is very important for state governments because there's going to be times where the U.S. government is going to try to infringe upon state power and states' rights, the Tenth Amendment acts like a shield. Whenever the U.S. government tries to encroach upon something that belongs to the state governments, the Tenth Amendment is there to protect state governments. There have been many times in U.S. history where the federal government tries to claim this power, where the states use the Tenth Amendment in court to stop the United States government from encroaching upon things that belong to them. Does that make sense for everybody? The Tenth Amendment acts like a shield. The Tenth Amendment is federalism. It tells us that the U.S. Constitution gives powers to the U.S. government, but it also gives powers to the state government. That's federalism. So if you ever see this on your quiz or on your test on Friday, what does the Tenth Amendment exemplify? It exemplifies federalism. It tells us that power is divided or distributed between state governments and the U.S. government. All right. So there's powers that belong to the U.S. government, or the federal government, and there's powers that belong to the state governments. Let's talk about concurrent powers, which is the third type of power. Anybody here in concurrent enrollment? Or concurrent enrollment class? They're also known as dual enrollment class. Oh, yes. oh, yeah. All right. If you're in a concurrent enrollment class, why is it called a concurrent enrollment class? Because you're in high school, but it's a college level class. Because at the same time, you're getting what? Credit. You're getting college credit and high school, high school credit at the same time. So what are concurrent powers? Powers that belong to who? Federal and state. To both the U.S. government and the state governments as well. There are certain powers that belong to the U.S. government and the state governments. There are certain policy areas that both governments are able to control. Give me one example. Give me one policy area one authority that belongs to both. Taxation. Some of you here who are working, you're getting, you're getting screwed for both sides. Um, your income is getting taken away by the federal government, but if you have to buy something, there's a sales tax that goes to which government? It goes to the state government. Does that make sense? So both 
authorities or both levels of government can tax. That's called a concurrent power. Today, you're going to need to know which powers are specific to the federal government, which powers are specific to the states, and which powers they can both do, which policy areas they can both affect. Let's go over here first. Powers exclusive to the federal government. Where can you find these powers again? Constitution. The U.S. Constitution. All right. Next. First one. Regulate what? Interstate and uh, international Very trade. Very good. Regulate interstate and international commerce. Interstate and international commerce. Control trading between states and between the United States and other countries. Specifically, this is given to um, the, the legislative branch or Congress. Back in the Articles of Confederation, who, was, who had this power? The state governments had this power. Now the U.S. government does. This is a very important power. You'll see later on why the Interstate Commerce Clause is so important. What does interstate mean? Economic activity between who? The states. Between the states. states. Let's go over here in state power. If the U.S. government is able to regulate interstate and international commerce, what can states regulate? Substance. Economic activity that happens where? In the city. Within the state itself. Within the state. If Julio over there is selling, is selling something, let's say cocaine. Let's say cocaine is illegal, right? Let's say Julio is selling cocaine to someone in California. What kind of commerce is that? Uh, so it can control that commerce. That all government can. But if he's selling cocaine to someone in San Antonio, that's within a state who can control that trade. The state, so regulate intra, intra-state commerce, intra. All right, let's focus over here. Only the U.S. government can coin money. Only the U.S. government can coin money. Those of you here that were from economics, you should probably know this. Federal Reserve coins money. Those of you that have money in your pockets, who printed that money? Which government? The U.S. government, the federal government printed that money, not the states. It used to be in the Articles of Confederation, both governments are able to print currency. No longer the case. Texas is not allowed to have its own currency. We don't have a Texas peso, for example. That's not allowed because that's exclusive to the U.S. government today. While in the Articles of Confederation, states enjoy that benefit, not anymore. I can't count, but number four. Declare what? <laughs> declare war. Only the U.S. government can declare war. Back in the Articles of Confederation, only the U.S. government can declare war, but the United States didn't have money to raise an army, so it doesn't really mean anything. But today, we do have the money, the U.S. government does have the money, and declaring war is a big deal today. Next, conduct foreign relations. Only the U.S. government can establish relationships with other countries. Only the federal government can negotiate treaties with other countries. Foreign relations belong to the U.S. government, specifically the executive branch or the presidency. No longer back in the Articles of Confederation where the states negotiate tariffs and treaties with other countries, that's no longer allowed today. So even though we have a close relationship with Mexico, the Texas government is not allowed to create treaties between the state and another country. That power belongs to the U.S. government. So all the treaties that we talked about in U.S. history last year, all of those were negotiated by the U.S. government. It doesn't involve the states. They're not allowed to conduct foreign relations. Let's go over here. Let's talk about powers that are reserved to the states. These are not explicitly mentioned in the U.S. Constitution, but they're protected by which amendment? The Tenth Amendment. All right. Let's go to number two. Establish local governments. Establish local governments. Give me an example of a local government. Uh, yeah. Sorry? The county. The county. The county government, like the Hidalgo County government? A city government, like the McAllen City government? Who created the McAllen City government? The U.S. government or the Texas government? Texas. The Texas government. The Texas government is able to create local governments. Does that make sense? Establish local governments. That's what we're doing right now. Oh, wait, no, not what we're doing right now. Conduct elections. Conduct elections. States are given the power to conduct elections. What does that mean? They're given the power to decide who can vote in their state, what are the requirements for voting, which means what, guys? Uh, 
what can the state government do to you all next year now that you have the right to vote? They can make it harder or easier for you to vote because they decide the requirements. So in some states, it's very easy to vote. Not a lot of requirements. In other states, like our state, it's fairly difficult to be able to vote. But that's decided at the state level. It's different per state. Some states like California, for example, it's very easy for their citizens to vote because their state governments made it that way. They can control this. A couple of decades ago, what did the states do with this power? Not a couple of days, decades ago, like five decades ago. What did states do with this power? Oh, for the, uh, sorry? With the restaurants, right? This is voting. This is voting, but you're in the right track. This is about elections. What do states do with the power to be able to control elections? They make it harder for African Americans to be able to vote by instituting what? Literacy tests. Taxes, well, poll taxes. Those were done at the state level because they could. They have the ability to control how hard it is or how easy it is to be able to vote in a state. So southern states like ours, who were racist at that time, they were able to disenfranchise African Americans by make it, making it harder for them to be able to vote because they did have that power. Does that make sense for everybody? Number four is what we're doing right now, administer education. This belongs to the state. So if you had a crappy 12 years, who do I tell you to blame? The state. Blame the state government. Education is different per state. There are some states that do it well. There are some states that don't do it well. There are some states that spend a lot of money on education. There are some states that are cheap about education. Unfortunately, you live in a state that doesn't do education very well. So if you graduate right now as a Texas citizen, people, as students from California who are graduating are probably smarter than you are just because they live in a different state, because states control their own destinies when it comes to education. Does that make sense? Anybody have any questions over that? All right, morality. What's good or what's bad? What kind of activities are allowed in a particular state is determined by the state government itself. So this usually pertains to sexual activity. What kind of sexual activity is allowed is determined by the state. A long time ago, states used this to um, prohibit homosexuality, for example. The, until 2002, um, there are some state laws against anal sex, against sodomy. Um, I don't know how they will find out, but that's something that states were able to do. Because they do decide morality. All right, let's go to number six. Everybody should be able to answer number six. Ratifying what? What can states do? Amendments. Ratifying amendments goes through the states. The states have a lot of authority when it comes to changing the U.S. Constitution, ratifying amendments. No amendment can be added to the U.S. Constitution without going through who? The states. The states. It has to go through the states. Next, licenses, marriage licenses are issued by the state government. So who married you? The U.S. government or the Texas government? Texas. The Texas government married you. Licenses and certificates, like my teacher certification, for example. Those of you that are be gonna become lawyers someday, you're gonna have to take the Texas bar so that you'll be able to get a practicing certificate here in Texas, but those are handed out by the state government itself. Any questions about this? So any kinds of licenses are usually administered by the state government itself. Federal, oh, before that, let's take a look at concurrent powers. Concurrent powers are powers or policy areas that they can both affect, but they both have authority over. Number one is levy taxes. We talked about taxes already. Both the U.S. and the state governments can levy taxes. Number two, borrow money. There are some states that owe a lot of money. So not only does the U.S. government have a deficit, there are some states that also have a deficit because they have that ability. Next, act and enforce laws. So we have state laws and we have U.S. laws. Which one is superior? U.S. US laws, according to what clause of the Constitution? Supremacy clause and provide for general welfare, like build roads, provide for a post office, um, fire departments, police departments, both of those are something that both governments share. All right, you're gonna see this a lot, a map like this on your AP exam and your exams from now on. Uh, like for example, the policy area that deals with the first map is the death penalty. 
Some states have the death penalty, some states don't. What's the reason for that? Because in the United States, we have federalism. We give states power. We give states power and authority to decide their own destinies when it comes to certain areas of policy. Like, for example, the death penalty. States are allowed to determine whether or not they're going to have the death penalty in their state. Unfortunately for you, you live in a state that does have the death penalty, so behave. Because there are such crimes in the, in the state of Texas that you can be punished by death for. But there are some states that do not have the death penalty. That's not an allowable punishment. But that's because of federalism. They're given that authority. They're given that power. In some countries, they have what we call a unitary government. What does unitary mean? One. They only have one government. They don't have to deal with federalism. What can you expect for maps in most countries? To be the same thing. The color is one. One policy, one government. But in the United States, states differ in some policy areas because states do have the power. We have federalism. This is marijuana legislation. In some states, marijuana is legal. In some states, medical marijuana is legal. In some states, um, recreational marijuana is legal. You happen to live in a state that's very strict about marijuana, so we have a lot of marijuana, laws against marijuana. If you live in Colorado, in California, they're very loose about their marijuana laws. So that's a good thing or a bad thing for you. It depends on what you feel about marijuana. All right, next, abortion. In all 50 states, abortion is legal. But states can decide how hard they're going to make their women um, have an abortion. So in some states, it's very easy for a woman to have an abortion. In some states, it's very difficult for a woman to have an abortion. Guess what we are? Do we make it difficult or do we make it easy? We make it very difficult. Like in the state of Texas, before you have an abortion, there's a law that was passed that you need to look at your child's ultrasound to discourage you from having an abortion. So whether or not you think that's a good thing or a bad thing, that's up to you, but that's because of federalism. They're given that authority. They're given that power. All right, let's move on. There are three clauses in the U.S. Constitution that you need to know about concerning federalism that affects the relationship between state governments and the U.S. government. One of the most important ones is the necessary and proper clause. Congress shall make any law that is what? Necessary, necessary and proper. So how does this affect federalism? It gives them more power. It gives them more power. Who gives? Which power? Who? Which government? The U.S. government. The U.S. government. When it says Congress, whose legislative branch is that? Is that the state legislature or the U.S. legislature? US. The U.S. legislature. It allows the U.S. government to claim to have powers that are not where? In the U.S. Constitution. Sometimes they get away with claiming to have powers that might belong to the states by justifying it as necessary and proper. This can allow the U.S. government, not always, but it can allow the U.S. government to claim to have powers that may have belonged to the states. If they can reason something is necessary and proper, then they may be able to take that away from the states. Anyone have any questions on this? Very powerful clause. Another powerful clause in the Constitution is the Interstate Commerce Clause. The U.S. Congress is given the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among several states. What kind of commerce are those? Foreign nations and several states. International and several states. Interstate. So international interstate commerce is given to the U.S. government. This clause right here, very important. It may not seem important to you guys. But the U.S. Supreme Court has interpreted the Commerce Clause to be very broad. Commerce Clause today, because of the interpretation of the Supreme Court in the past, can mean pretty much any economic activity. Which means the U.S. government has authority over almost all economic activities in the United States. Think about it this way. Look at everything that you owned. If your jacket, if your glasses, was built in one state and then assembled in another state, then the U.S. government can claim that that's what? That's interstate commerce. So they can control it. I'll give you an, an idea how powerful the interstate commerce clause is. Back in the 1960s, the U.S. government passed a law. It's called the Civil Rights Act of 1964. If you paid attention to me or Valero last year, you should know what the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 forbids any public places from doing what? Segregation or discrimination. Like in restaurants, in hospitals, in hotels, segregation or discrimination is now illegal thanks to this law. 
However, there was huge protests around the states about this particular law, especially in the southern states where people were more racist. Like in the state of Texas, there was this hotel that was operating in the state of Texas that did not allow black customers inside of the hotel. They said, we don't have to listen to the U.S. government because our hotel is within what? It's Texas. It's within Texas. It's under Texas authority. This is an economic activity that happens within a state. So we don't have to listen to the U.S. government. We don't have to follow this law. But then the Supreme Court comes in and says, since you have customers coming from other states, we can consider your hotel as what kind of commerce? You got the interstate commerce, so who can tell them what to do? The U.S. government can. There's this restaurant in Arizona who did not let black people inside of their restaurant. They said, we don't have to listen to you. We only listen to the Arizona government. Just like Texas, they're perfectly fine with people being racist. The US, the U.S. Supreme Court comes in and says, since the ingredients found in your food are grown from other states, since the beef that you use and the vegetables that you use are from other states, that's interstate commerce can control them. The U.S. government can. So yes, you do have to listen to the U.S. government. You need to realize how powerful the Commerce Clause is. Because almost all economic activity that happens in the United States can be considered interstate. And it allows the federal government to, have, to claim to have authority over almost all economic activity. And you'll see how important that is tomorrow. Alright, let's move on. The Supremacy Clause, everybody knows this, U.S. law and treaties made by the United States is supreme over what? The states. State law. States. U.S. law is supreme over state law. I talked about marijuana legislation before and how in some states like California and Colorado, it's legal, but under federal law, it's what? It's illegal. The only reason why those guys in California and Colorado are not in prison right now is because the U.S. government has not chosen to strictly enforce federal law. Back in the, oh, by the way, it usually depends on who the president is. Back in the Obama days, President Obama pretty much let the states do whatever they want when it comes to marijuana. He did not enforce U.S. laws. Now that we have a Republican president under Donald Trump, and they're not really too keen, Republicans are not really too keen on marijuana legislation, they enforce those laws stricter. They're still very loose about it but he's more strict about marijuana legislation. Because remember, the executive branch enforces the law. So it's up to the President of the United States whether or not he's going to enforce it very strictly or not strictly. But when it comes to marijuana laws, they, in the, in the recent past, they haven't enforced it that strictly. Any questions about the Supremacy Clause? This defines the relationship between the U.S. government and the states because federal authority is supreme over state authority. All right, you listen here. Federalism, or the relationship between the U.S. government and the states, have evolved over time. It has, that relationship has changed. It used to be in the very beginning of the United States, just like what our founding fathers intended. The powers and the responsibility of each government were distinct and separated. State governments did their thing about education and elections, and who left them alone? The federal government left them alone. That's your power. You do your own thing. And the federal government exercised their own authority. The powers, the responsibilities, the authority is separated. They're distinct. They don't try to mess with each other. They left each other alone. But things began to change because of a particular event in U.S. history. Anybody know what that event is? This is a war. Too early. There was a point in U.S. history where the states were faced with a lot of problems, and they have to they had to ask the federal government for some help. Oh, the Great Depression. The Great Depression. During the Great Depression in the 1930s, this relationship began to change, and what happened is now, since the 1930s. The authority, the power, the responsibilities now are intermingled. Today, the federal government, especially the federal government, has hands on things that used to only belong to who? To the state government. They have influence over the states today. So, how has it changed? Before, it was like a layer cake, where the powers and responsibilities are what? Separated, they were clearly defined, they left each other alone. This is called dual federalism. Dual federalism means two. 
dual federalism. Responsibilities, power, authority are separated. They were distinct. We knew what the state governments did and we knew what the federal government did. They did not try to step over the boundaries. But ever since the Great Depression, that cake begins to change. And now we have more, a more of a marble cake relationship. Can you see the layers in a marble cake? No, they're not clearly defined. So responsibilities, power, and authority today are shared between the two levels of government. Power, authority, responsibilities are shared. I told you yesterday, or I told you today, that education belongs to the states. That's not true anymore. And our education system is being heavily influenced by the federal government, and you'll see how in a little bit. All right, so it used to be we had what kind of federalism, guys? What is this? What's layer cake federalism called? Dual, Dual federalism. And then we've changed to what? Cooperative. Cooperative federalism or marble cake federalism. All right. The question today is how is the federal government able to influence the state governments? How are they able to influence authority or policy areas that used to belong to only the states? There's a quick answer to this. Anybody know what the quick answer is? This is called fiscal federalism. How has the United States government been able to influence state power? You guys yes. ever talked about fiscal policy in economics? Yes. Oh, yeah. How? <laughs> Money. Money. Today, states are faced with problems that they can't solve themselves. So they have to turn to who? They have to turn to the U.S. government for help. The U.S. government has a lot of resources, and they offer it to the states. But that money is not going to come for free. By taking that money, states voluntarily surrender some of their powers to the U.S. government. So today, states are desperate. They need daddy. They need the federal government. But daddy is not going to offer the help for free. There's going to be consequences, and that usually means state governments giving up some authority to the federal government and doing what the federal government wants them to do in areas that used to belong to just only them. So, to give you an idea how desperate states are, look at this map. This map shows you how much of a state government's budget are they getting from the federal government. Look at Colorado over here. 32% of Colorado's money that they spend every year, where does it come from? It comes from the national government. If the national government today decides we're not going to give you that money anymore, what's going to happen to Colorado? They're going to be in huge trouble. 30% of their budget is coming from the federal government. Even wealthy states like us, look how much we depend on the U.S. government. How much is that? About 40% of our budget, of our, the Texas government's budget, comes from the federal government. California, the wealthiest state in the United States, 32% of their budget comes from the federal government. If the U.S. government snaps its finger today and removes that funding, it removes the money that it's giving the states, a lot of these states are going to collapse. They need the money, and they're desperate for it. But like I told you, it usually doesn't come for free. The money offered by the federal government to the states is called grants, or grants in aid. So this is federal funding given to the states by the federal government. Federal funding given to the states. Federal funding given to the states. Usually, grants come in the form of categorical grants. Categorical grants, go and write this down, for a specific purpose. For a specific purpose. This is money given by the federal government to the states for a specific purpose. And I want you to notice how the federal government is able to control the states and how the states have to give up some authority and some power. When the federal government offers the states money, it usually says what it needs to exactly do with that money. So if I'm offering Texas money, the federal government says, here's some money, but this is how exactly you're going to spend the money. And if you're a state, you're desperate for federal funding, you're probably going to take the money and you're going to spend it exactly the way the federal government wants it to be spent. So I'll give you an example that relates to you all. How many of you like your school lunches and your school breakfasts? 
course you don't because it tastes like cardboard. This is because of fiscal federalism. A long time ago, the federal government offered the states help with their school lunches, providing school lunches for students. So here's some money. But if you are going to take that money from the federal government, you're going to have to spend it on what kind of school lunches? On healthy school lunches. So that we can combat diabetes and other um, unhealthy things in the United States. So the US government is offering help, but by taking that help, the United States are giving up authority. Who did I tell you education belongs to? It belongs to the states. But what is the state giving up when it takes that money from the federal government? Control and power over what? Over education. Now, the federal government has its hands on education now. Does that make sense? So, an example of this is school lunches. That's a categorical grant. There's a type of grant that states love. Not all grants are evil for the states. Most of the time, they don't like grants. They like the money, but they don't like the federal authority that comes with that money. But they do like block grants. So what are block grants? If categorical grants are given for a specific purpose, block grants are given for a broad purpose. So broad purpose is a federal government offering the state's help, but for a broad purpose. So what does that mean? Let's look at the other example I gave you about a categorical grant. A long time ago, the federal government offered money to the states, specifically for what kind of lunches? Okay. Healthy school lunches. So what's a block grant? If the federal government offers that money, for what? Just say, here's some money, spend it on education. What can those states spend the money on? Football stadiums. Football stadiums, more teachers, increasing teacher pay, better books, better desk. The point is, block grants give school more authority and more power. It gives states more freedom. It gives, it gives states more leeway in how they're going to spend the money. That's why states, they love, they prefer block grants over categorical grants. Because categorical grants come with state with federal authority, with federal conditions. While block grants, they have more of a leeway in how they're going to spend the money. Do not put this on your essays. Do not put block grants allow the states to spend the money however they want. They still have to spend that money about what? Education. It still has to be spent on education. What block grants allow them to do is have more leeway, have more discretion, have more freedom in how they're going to spend the money. Which states enjoy. Alright. Another way the federal government um, influences the states is through something called mandates. Mandates, if, you don't, if you're not going to remember what mandates are, remember this word. They're orders. Orders or directives. Given by who to whom? Given by the national government to? The states. Given by the national government to the states. They're orders given by the U.S. government, the federal government to the states. It carries the force of law. Mandates can come in three forms. If a mandate is coming from the legislative branch of Congress, it's probably from a law. Because Congress creates laws, right? If it comes from the executive branch, if it comes from the president, it's usually an executive order. We'll talk about executive orders later on, don't worry about it. If it comes from the judicial branch, it's probably a what? What is, what is the judicial branch? Judges. Judges. The courts. So what is it probably? It's a ruling. It's a decision. A court ruling. I'll give you an example that most of you here should be familiar with. 1953. This is famous Supreme Court ruling. Anybody remember what it was? Oh my God. It's called Brown versus Board of Education. Brown versus Board of Education. What was the mandate? instituted by the Supreme Court in Brown versus Board of Education. That all schools within the states have to what? Allow integration. Have to integrate. They have to stop what? Segregating. Segregating. They have to integrate their schools. That was an order given by the federal government, specifically the judicial branch, to the states. That's a mandate. Anybody have any questions about a mandate? Yes, uh, for the J. What does the R mean? Sorry? For J? 
ruling. 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 Or a decision. All right. I'll give an example of, oh, by the way, mandates usually carry rewards or punishment. The federal government can reward states for obeying, and they can punish states for disobeying or for non-compliance. So if you comply, if you obey the federal government, you are going to enjoy benefits sometimes. Sometimes it only comes with punishments if you don't obey. If there's non-compliance, states get punished. How? How are they rewarded? How is the state punished for obeying or not obeying, complying or not complying with a federal mandate? Money. Grants. If a state chooses to obey, that might mean the federal government gives them more money. If a, uh, if a state chooses not to comply, what does that mean? Less. It might take away some money that it gives to the states. Remember, states, this is like a sugar daddy relationship. They become dependent on the federal government. 40%, 42% of their budget comes from the federal government. The federal government can take that away if they don't obey the federal government. So a mandate comes with incentives, but it can, uh, but it can um, come with punishments as well. I'll give you an example that pertains to you all. If you had a crappy 12 years of middle school, elementary, and high school, it's probably because of a mandate called No Child Left Behind. This is a law passed by Congress when I was growing up, 2001, under the Bush administration. The US government saw that test scores are going down in the United States um, compared to other countries. So they wanted to boost those test scores. So they instituted a mandate. It's called No Child Left Behind that required the states to what? What have you been doing your entire lives? Learning in school. Uh -huh. Yeah, learning maybe. <laughs> Sorry? Sorry? Standardized testing. Standardized testing. So they said, we're going to offer you money. This is a mandate, but if you obey what we want you to do, you're going to get some money from the federal government. If you don't, we're going to take away some funding from you. So there's a reward and there's a punishment for not obeying or for obeying. If the states take the money, they're going to have to institute regular standardized testing. So when I was growing up, it was called tax. When you guys were growing up, it's called EOC or STAR. That's because of a mandate. It didn't work. We're still dumb. But that was what the intention of the US government, to improve test scores in the United States. And if you're a state that was stubborn and did not want to follow federal orders, that mandate, they're going to take away that money from you. So what did most states do? Actually, what did all states do? They took the money. They're desperate. Yes, ma'am. Do private schools have to follow that, too? No. Unless they're getting funds, some private schools get money from the federal government, they might have to. All right, next, next example over here. Um, it's the drinking age. What's the legal drinking age? Legal drinking age in the United States? Twenty one. What is it in California? Twenty one. What is it in Hawaii? 21. In all 50 states, it's 21. What's odd about that? People are drinking. Mm -hmm. Related to what we talked about today, what's odd about all 50 states having their legal drinking age 21? What, we just, what did we just talk about? Mandates. What's odd about that, guys? The national one. Oh, states usually choose. The state government chooses what's moral, what's immoral, what kind of activity is permitted, and what kind of activity is not permitted. So, what should you expect? Different, Different drinking age. But today, in all 50 states in the union, the drinking age is 21. So, who intervened? The, government. the, national, the national government intervened. So, back in the 1980s, this was the legal drinking age in the United States. Some states have it at 21, some states had it at 20, some states had it at 18. The blue states that you see over here, they had their legal drinking age at 18. But then mothers in the United States started complaining to the US government that there's a lot of drunk driving by teenagers. So this US government decided to do about it, something about it. So they instituted a mandate. They said, here's some money for your highway state so you can fix your highways. But if you take the money, what are you gonna have to do? 
you're going to change your drinking laws and you're going to make your drinking age to what? 21. To 21. There are some states that try to resist, like Louisiana resisted for a couple of years. So if you wanted to party back then, go to Louisiana because their drinking age was at 18. But eventually, Louisiana came in. They took the money. And now, in all 50 states of the United States, the drinking age is at 21. That's because of the federal government. Anyone have any questions over that? All right, next thing we're going to talk about today are unfunded mandates. Usually mandates not really welcomed by the states. They don't like it because the federal government's telling them what to do. These mandates over here are what they hate the most. Governors of the states, state legislatures, they hate unfunded mandates from the federal government. So what is an unfunded mandate? Usually, mandates that come from the federal government are funded. So the federal government's telling you what to do, but they're giving you money to execute the order. So it would be like me telling Angelica, Angelica over here, here's $10, go buy chicken for me. I'm telling her what to do so she may not like it, but at least I'm giving her money to execute the order. So what's an unfunded mandate? The US government is telling them what to do, but no money to execute the order. So it would be like what? Go back to the metaphor. Go buy chicken. Who's going to have to buy the chicken? She's going to have to spend her own money to obey my order. So do you see how states would hate these? Right? They're getting told what to do. They're getting screwed either way. They're getting told what to do. But the federal government doesn't give them money to execute the order. So I'll give you an example. And this is the most popular example of an unfunded mandate. It's called the Americans with Disabilities Act, or ADA. If you paid attention last year, you should remember what ADA is. It's a mandate coming from the federal government that says, in all your public buildings, including schools, for example, you need to provide accommodations for people who are disabled. Give me some forms of those accommodations. Ramps, special parking spaces, sorry. Elevators. elevators. So we have an elevator here in school. That's because of ADA. So it was for a good cause, to give opportunity for people who are disabled in the United States. But the states protested, and they protested heavily. Not because they hate disabled people, but because it's an unfunded mandate, which means those ramps, those elevators that have to be built, who's going to have to pay for that? The state. the state themselves will have to pay for it. The federal government did not provide funding. Any questions? All right, so you have homework tonight. Remember your binder. Remember to correct stuff. Um, what was I going to ask? Make sure you study for your test, guys. We'll, we'll finish this tomorrow.